I wanted to talk about. So I've lately been working in the in on more extremal problems on problems with logs and log logs in this is the world I, I swore I would never get into, but I'm finally getting into the world of log logs. I have a theorem for the log log in. Let me tell you about it. Um, so the, uh, the English, this is a problem about induced subgraphs. I guess everybody knows what an induced subgraph is, but it's, a sub, it's not a general subgraph. It's a subgraph you can get by deleting vertices. Um, and the, it's, we're, we're focusing on what's called the Erdős Heinel conjecture. That's, that's an observation that general graphs might only have, might not have big peaks and big stable sets. Ramsey's theorem says they have, if the graph is big enough, it has a large peak or a large stable set, but it has to be really big. And in general, if you have an n vertex graph, it might not have a clique or stable set of size bigger than log n. But the observation is, if you exclude any induced subgraph, then you can do better. The, so, for instance, if you have no, um, if you have a list of them here, I might as well tell you. If you say there's no kt, then you have a stable set of size at least, well, number of vertices to the t minus one. I think it's half that or something. But which is much bigger than log. If you say there's no, no um, bull, which is this graph, then you get a key core stable set. bigger than the size of g to the quarter. Uh, this can't be right, must be one of the two points. Um, if you say no, uh, well, there's a few other small cases now. Uh, like if you say no uh, claw, then you get a click with stable set, I think it's g to the, g to the, what is that, a quarter, half, third? I'll say a quarter to be safe, it might be better. If you say no three, four vertex path, you get a clico stable set of size g to the half. So whatever you from empirical evidence, it seems that whatever you exclude, instead of the dependence being log, you said it's certainly a polynomial, which is sudden it's number of vertices to some power. And that's the conjecture that's uh, The Erdős Heinel conjecture from 1977, I think it is, is that for all h, for every graph h, there exists a constant such that every h free graph, h free means no induced subgraph isomorphic to h, has a click or stable set. at least g to the c. There exists a c positive, not zero. Um, and that's a conjecture, and it's been, a, it's, as I said, from 1977, and it's still open. I mean, we've made very little progress on it. It's a famous conjecture. Lots and lots of people have worked on it, trying to get little bits, and we're, we still only know, we only know it's true for a very few graphs. So let me tell you the graph is vulnerable. Um, co-graph, um, first of all, I need to talk about co-graphs. Co-graphs are important. Let me tell you what a co-graph is. Right? It's the same thing as a, as a P4 free graph. P4 means the path with four vertices. Not length like four, it's four vertices. And co-graphs have the nice property that they're either, they're either disconnected or the complement is disconnected. Uh, for any co-graph, it's either the union of two smaller co-graphs with no edges between, or it's the union of two smaller co-graphs with all edges between. 
So either the, either the graph's disconnected or the complement is disconnected, uh, unless it's only got one vertex. And you can build them that way. You just start from one vertex graphs and you're allowed to take disjoint unions and you're allowed to take complete joint, which is you take two graphs and make each of these joint each of those. And uh, that's another characterization of co-graphs. It's the graphs you can build by this process. And so the they're very easy to understand and they're perfect. And you can prove they have, well, because they're perfect, they have big to a stable sets of size, square root, the number of vertices. Um, so that's the first case. Uh, that's not what I should prove. It was a theorem of, of uh, Ernest and Heinel that the Ernest Heinel conjecture is true For if H is a co-graph. Now, what I just said was that co-graphs have large streaks and stable set. That's not the right observation. It's when you exclude a co-graph, the graphs not containing it have large streaks and stable sets, is what we want to prove. It's, I misled you there. So, so if, if the small graph, the graph we're excluding, is a co-graph, then you always get a large Tico stable set. set Tico stable set is some, so for all, for all co graphs H, there is a C such that the statement is true. That was the theorem of Edison Heinel in, there, in the 1980 something paper, 1986, I think. And it's been proved for some other things since. Um, Alan Park, Semerhidi, Alan Park, uh, Solomoshi, to credit, proved. Uh, in 2000 and something, 2000, 2001, proved that if H1 and H2 satisfy the theorem, let's say they have the property, meaning they satisfy the theorem, then you can substitute then substituting H2 for a vertex of H1 makes another graph of the problem. What does substituting mean? It means here's H1, there's some particular vertex of it. Here's H2. So what you do is you erase this vertex and you make H2 adjacent to what used to be all the neighbors of, all of this vertex. Make all the vertices of H2 adjacent to what used to be the neighbor set of the, of the first vertex. You substitute H2 for this vertex, which is now visible. Um, so that's, that gives you a nice big class of graphs, except if you substitute for, if you start with co-graphs and you substitute co-graphs for vertices, you just get more co-graphs. So that doesn't get you very far. But, but so there are other graphs to which the Edison conjecture is known. Well, I, I listed them here, right? There's the bull. So it's true for the bull, which is this graph. And that's the theorem of Chodnowski and Safra. And that's, I think, 2000 and something, uh, 2008. And recently we proved it's true for C5, just the five cycle. And that was, uh, was um, Maria Chernovsky, Alex Scott, uh, Sophie Sperkel and me. So that's CSSS. And that was, when was that? 2021? And that's all it's done for. So it's, these two graphs, 
and cut graphs and anything you can make by substitution. And that's the complete list. That's not really many graphs. It's not a big, big list of graphs of having worked on hard work on this problem for 40 years. It's not, we're not very far ahead. And, and people are trying alternative approaches to make some progress. And there are various things you could try. Um, we started on a new one, which and we're making some, some, we're getting some results out of it. So I wanted to tell you about it. Levis and Heimel proved in the paper where they proposed their conjecture, they proved that for all H, there exists a C such that if G is H free, and it should be C positive, C positive, such that if G is H free, then then the max of oh, omega g and alpha g, omega g means the clique number, alpha g means the larger stable set, is at least uh, not polynomial, but some but sort of near polynomial. It's e to the constant square root log n, log of the number of roots. Now, if this square root wasn't here, this, if this was e to the constant log n, that's the same as. Uh, so e to the constant log g, that's the same as g to the g to the constant, which is what we want to prove. So it's this square root that's, a, that's, that's how far Erdős and Hein are from, from the, proving their conjecture. Uh, but, I mean, but this is better than if you if nothing is excluded. If nothing is excluded, you only get log g. Well, this is a lot bigger than log g. It's sort of halfway between log g and uh, what they really want to be doing. So, if we can't prove the Ernest Heimel conjecture itself, what about doing better than, than the Ernest Heimel theorem? Can we make this number any bigger? And uh, I want to convince you, so we've been thinking about the function e to the c root log g log log g. Which may not seem like much of an improvement, but there's a reason. Uh, so once again, if this log log were a log, then that again is what we want. It gets rid of the square root and we're back to the other time conjecture. So, but there's a better reason why, why this seems like a natural thing to go for if you want to improve this without proving the whole conjecture. That's all, I'll explain that in a minute. And there's, a, there's also a history of this. There's a, uh, four or five years ago, before we proved the C5 theorem, we proved that C5 has this property. So C5, you get, you get things of that size. And, and recently, uh, Buczyk and, and uh, Blanco, Blanco and Buczyk proved Proved uh, <coughs> so P5 is the smallest graph that the Erdős Heimel conjecture is not known for P5. If if G is P5 free, we really like to know that it's got a polynomial size clique with stable set. But they prove that alpha, the max of omega and alpha. Is at least something like this, not that, but they prove e to the c log g to the two thirds. Tell me if I go off the edge of the board, I think that should be all right. Tell me if I do. Um, which, which, is, you know, which is another way to improve this instead of sticking on log term, they actually change the square root to something better, uh, but only for p5. But the, and, but the nice thing about their proof is that the very start of it, they gave a really neat short proof that if you exclude P5, then this is true, which we didn't know before. So they proved that P5 is true, then this, then you've got at least that bound. 
And, and actually, they proved, proved something better, but they had to work hard for this to get just that. It was nice and easy. And so we thought, let's let's see if we can use prove a similar thing for for excluding other graphs. So that's that's the goal. This function. Let's have a word for it. Let's say um, H is friendly. If there exists C such that um, max of omega G and alpha G is at least this, this thing, E to the C square root of log G log log G for every H free graph. Um, so I mean, it's such it wouldn't have been unreasonable if we and we were sort of disappointed. That we couldn't actually prove that all graphs were friendly. I mean, it ought to be true that all graphs are friendly if you believe the Earth's final position. So, so we got three functions. We got, we got, uh, let's say e to the c log g, which is the Earth's final condition. We got e to the we got e to the c square root log g log log g. Then we've got e to the c square root log g. And uh, this this is bigger than that. This is bigger than that. This is true for all graphs. If you exclude h, then it's conjecture that they're all true for all graphs. If you exclude h, this is the Erdős-Einl conjecture. It's true only for it's true, it's known to be true only for a few graphs. And what about this? Um, so we can do better. We can do better. Here's what we can prove we can prove that if you take a co graph, so all co graphs satisfy the other final condition, but a, a co graph plus any plus a vertex joined arbitrarily is friendly. That's theorem one. Theorem two is split graphs are friendly. What's a, what's a split graph? It's a split, split graph is you can take a clique and the stable set and put, put ages arbitrarily between them. And this is friendly. Uh, I said P5 was still a problem for Erdős Heidel. We can prove that P8 is friendly, so any, and that, therefore anything shorter. I don't think we can get P9 yet. Maybe we can. P, let me just see, P8. Yeah, we're okay with P8. Maybe, maybe yesterday or two days ago we came up with a proof of P9, but I'm not going to, I don't swear to that because it, it came up and then it fell down again. And the, I'm not sure if it's up or down at the moment. I think it's up, but it's not guaranteed. Mm, um, uh, yeah. I think it is C7, not P9 yet. So what? It is C7, not P9 yet. It's not P9 yet? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me again, is it right? But split graphs, are not, split graphs are a nice big class of graphs. You know, they're, they're as general as bivalent graphs. They're just they're like bivalent graphs, except you have a click on one side instead of a stable side. Halfway between bivalent graphs and complements of bivalent graphs. So we were quite proud of this result. And here's a more general thing containing all these facts that if H 
H is a co-graph plus a clique. And H is a co-graph plus a stable set. Then H is friendly. So what do I mean? What do I mean? What's it? So let's look at P8, for instance. This is a co-graph plus a clique, because I can take that clique, and the rest of the graph is a co-graph. So in other words, if you can make it become a co-graph by deleting a clique. So deleting that clique makes, makes the co-graph. And if I delete, if I delete, say, I don't know, this and that stable set, that makes a co-graph. So this graph is a co-graph plus a clique and a co-graph plus a stable set. So that means that the pH is friendly. If you look at a split graph, it's a co-graph plus a clique because this is a co-graph. If I delete this clique, it makes a co-graph. Or if I delete that stable set, it makes a co-graph. So, so this, this stable set thing is a, is a special case of this. And also, obviously, that one is because this is both a clique and a stable set. So that's what I'd like to give you an idea of the proof of. Is everything clear so far? Is everybody happy? Any questions? Now it's a horrible function. The square root log g log log g doesn't look very very nice, but it's not so bad. There's a there is a natural reason to work on it. Um, the way Erdős so let me tell you the idea of Erdős Heinold's proof. What they did was they got. So to prove e to the square root, e to the constant square root log, essentially what they did was they proved if, if here's an h free graph, then you can find two sets of size uh, number of vertices divided by a power of mu. I uh, didn't define mu yet. Let me define mu first. So mu of G just means the largest co-graph in G is the size of the largest co-graph. Not meaning the, the number of vertices in the largest co-graph contained in G. As an induced subgraph. So we're, we're interested in the maximum the largest clique and largest stable set. But we might as well, cliques and stable sets are both co-graphs. So if you contain a large clique or large stable set, you contain a large co-graph. On the other hand, if you contain a large co-graph, then you contain a large peak or stable set, because co-graphs have large peaks and stable sets. So instead of saying max of alpha and omega, we might as well say max of mu. So another way to say the other channel conjecture, if you exclude any graph, then mu of g is at least a polynomial in the number of vertices. So it's all about mu. Um, what I was trying to do basically is they proved in any H free graph for any H, if, if a graph is H free, then there exists two sets A and B such that the sizes are G over some power of mu. The power doesn't matter. So that's something. Ideally, what, what would you really like? You really like a, either, this is a, what we call a pure pair. A, a pure pair means a pair of sets either with no edges between them or all edges between them. But, but I have to write so many definitions. Let me get that one back. So either there are no A, B edges or all A, B edges are present. 
all possible AD, AD edges are present. So what you really like is if A and B makes a pure pair. Suppose that were true. They didn't really prove this, but suppose they did. Then you could apply induction. You could say this has got a big co-graph. That's got a big co-graph. And now the union is a co-graph. Because there's either no way is between them all or one is complete to the other. And the, the co-graphs are preserved under, the, under both those operations. So now you do the arithmetic, you say, you know, this inductively would contain a co-graph of size, whatever it is you're trying to prove, each of the C root log size of A, and you know the size of A is that. And this would also have a co-graph of that size. So you'd end up with a co-graph of size 2E to the C root log, whatever this number is, G over, over mu of G to the K. And now, and now you check your, you check that this is at least e to what you really wanted. It's a, it's at least e to the c root log g. If you adjust, if you just, the c is sufficiently small as a function of k. Um, I mean, there's and there's some arithmetic you have to do there, but it's, but it's, but, uh, but, but getting two sets of that size is the, is the trick. If you can. If you can get sets of size g over a power of mu that are complete or anti-complete, then the proof just goes through by induction. If you're trying to prove this statement, and if you can get two sets like that that are complete or anti-complete, the proof goes through by induction. They didn't actually get that. What they got was that you can get two sets of this size where there's either almost no almost no edges between them or almost all edges are between them. And uh, that's we can go to the complement if we have to. So let's let's assume almost no edges are between. Well, um, what they get is edge density that everybody here, its degree in B is only is only uh, a small fraction of B. So every vertex in B, every vertex in A is adjacent to At most, something like B over two mu neighbors in B, vertices um, in B. So I mean, it could be adjacent to all of B, and it's actually adjacent to B over two mu. Okay. Um, they they do they get a theory like this where you can specify the degree, the max degree you want. You can you can say what you want. And they, the sizes of A and B come out to be polynomials in that. In that number, if I want if I want max to be c times b, then I'd end up with something which is something like c the power of c times g. I think that's right. Yeah. If I wanted max to be c, the max to be c times b, then I get a and b of sizes g, a power of c times g. Not mentioning mu anyway. But when they apply it, when they use it, they need to take c to be to be one over two b. Uh, Paul, just to let you know, we cannot see the denominator in the in the bottom line. It's oh, did I hear? Of, yeah. Oh, so sorry. Okay. That um, we no longer see. But uh, so B over two mu. So this degree is only a small fraction of B. If you believe, if you had that, why would, that would still be just as good as if you had two sets with no edges between them at all. Because what was the argument if you had two sets with no edges between them? You pick a co-graph here, then you pick a co-graph here and take the disjoint union. But you can do the same thing. You pick a co-graph here, its size is only mu. And then each of its vertices has very few neighbors over there. B over, B over two mu. So altogether, if you look at all the people here that might have a neighbor in my little co-graph, it's only half of B. I still got half of B left, which in the constants like that don't make any difference. So I can still get a big co-graph in the rest of it and do the same arithmetic again. So as far as the arithmetic is concerned, it's just as good as having no edges at all between them, if you can get them very sparse. That's a that's an important thing to notice that uh, 
in spots, can cause a sense in a very sparse like that, where the degree of sparsity has mu in denominator, is just as good as having no edges at all, because you pick a curvature, here, it's only size of mu. So altogether, it can't have edges to more than half of B, because each one vertex is only joined to B over two mu. So again, getting a sparse pair with sizes uh, g over the power of mu, that gives the Ernest-Einel theorem e to the c square root log g. If you got, uh, let's say, complete or anti-complete, a pure pair. Which were the set of sizes a constant times g, different constant, that would give you e to the c log g. In other words, it would give you a polynomial in g, no square root. If, it, if these sets were linear in the number of vertices, and you do the same arithmetic, you end up you end up proving proving the Ebershine conjecture itself. Um, so what if, uh, why pure and not sparse? Well, it doesn't make a difference. You could go for a sparse pair here, but it turns out whenever you can get a sparse pair, you can also get a pure pair. So it uh, doesn't seem to make sense talking about sparse pairs. But halfway between them, what, what if I can get a set of size uh, G over mu K, the power of mu, and a linear set. So this one's big, constant energy. So one set of this size and one set of the linear size. Again, sparse. And again, whenever I say sparse, I mean sparse or possibly sparse in the complement. It may be almost none of the edges are there or almost all of the edges are there. If you can get that, that gives us e to the c square root log g log log g. So from that point of view, this is a you know this is a natural thing to aim for, given that that was a success for Edith Heinel, and getting two linear sets was a success for something else. That's some previous work that he worked on. Um, so getting this mixed case of one set of size geo and use the game, one set of size linear, that's what comes out. But really, this is the motivation, because this seems a natural, a natural thing to hope for. And that's that's really the, the reason why we're doing this this obscure function log g log log g. Because the proof works well. And once again, what would be the proof? You, if you could always get two sets of this size, you pick a co-graph here, you look at the people over there, the neighbors in that co-graph, and it's, you arrange the density across so that this is only half of those vertices, and then you pick a co-graph in the rest, and you can take the disjunction of these two co-graphs. And now you do the arithmetic, and it's a big, long, complicated calculation, but it gives you the right answer in the end, if you have people on your own side that can do these calculations. But I have three co-authors and they're all wonderful at doing these calculations. It's just me that can't do them, it seems to me. But, uh... um, anyway, so that's the idea. Let me, let me show you the proof method. How can we get to, so, I said if H is, uh, if it's a co-graph plus a clique, where these can be joined arbitrarily, and it's a co-graph, different co-graph, plus a stable set, where again, these are joined arbitrarily. If, if H is this and H is that, 
So in other words, you can find a click to make click to an H to make a cograph, and you can find a stable set in H to make a cograph. But when you delete it, makes it cograph. Then H is friendly. So let me show you. Let me make that look a bit more plausible. Um, let, um, let me assume, just for simplicity, let me assume this is size three and this is size three. But the, the same argument works in general. It's just going to be Ramsey still. But, uh, but let's suppose there's a triangle. This is a cograph plus a triangle, and it's a cograph plus a table set of size three. Just to, so now, you know, any six vertices, they either contain a tree, a triangle, or a stable set of size three. So let's start with six vertices. And now, for each triple here, let's let's say this is you know, C1 and this is C2. Let's glue on a copy of C1. So let's glue on a copy of C1 onto this triple, however it's supposed to be drawn. And now, let's say that triple will glue on another copy of C1. However, it's supposed to be joined. And for every triple here, we'll do on a copy of C1. So lots of copies of C1. So it'll be six to three, whatever that is, copies of C1, each attached to some triple in the right way. So that if this is a triangle, then you take this triangle and those edges and C1, and, you, and that's H. Um, and I don't care what edges you put between these and the other three vertices here. And I don't care what edges you put between these copies of C. I guess I do care about that. Let's put no edges between these copies of C. And I'll do the same for C2. For each copy of for each triple here, uh, attach a copy of C2 to it, to it so that if this turns out to be a stable set, we get a copy of H. And the same for every other triple. So now what's this set? This, the union of all these C's is one giant cograph, which I can't draw, but all these C's together with all these C's, it's just, this is a cograph. Right, because they're, they're individually cographs and there's no edges between them. So this whole, this enormous graph is a cograph plus six votes. Now I'll show you a proof that so this is a cograph C plus six vertices, and there's, there's some uh, adjacency here. And I'm not telling you what the degree, what the ages are here. This whole graph is a cograph plus six vertices, and I'm not going to care what those ages are. Now, I'll show you a theorem that if you call this graph eight, uh, let's call it J, then if G is J3, well, the, the J is, friend, sorry, they're wrong. If, Let, let's take the set of all graphs you can get by filling in edges on this. So that's, uh, I don't know, each one to J1 up to J, however many it is, J10 to the 10 or something. I mean, how many edges you can fill in, ways you can fill in edges that be the, the all completions of J. I mean, this graph is fixed, the cross edges are fixed, but you're allowed to fill in edges between these six vertices how you like. So you can make lots of different graphs of them. So list them all, with some five edges of graphs. And then we'll prove a theorem that says, if G contains none of, of J1 to J, however many it is, then, then uh, mu of G 
is at least e to the c square root log g log of g. So suppose you believe that, because that's that's going to be the that's the main term. Suppose you believe that. Oh, but the thing is, all of these graphs, J1 to J2, however you fill this in, suppose I, suppose I contain J6, J, one of these J's. So there's, there's some way to fill in these edges so that this graph is contained in my graph G. But then my graph G contained H, because there's either a clique or a stable set here. A there's either a triangle or a stable triple here. And if there's, say, a triangle, you take you take the corresponding co-graph and look at this sub look at co the corresponding c2 no actually c1 look at the corresponding c1 and you say that's a copy of h if you contain this graph however these edges are filled in if you contain this graph with those edges filled in in any way then you must contain h so that's the that's the observation there is you can make a co-graph Plus a few extra vertices, such so, so that however you fill the edges on these co-graphs, the graph you get contains H. If H has this property that it's a co-graph plus a clique and it's a co-graph plus a stable set, then you can make a different co-graph. So a different co-graph plus a few extra vertices, such so, so that however you fill in those edges, it contains H. So if you can approve that excluding all these sort of friends of J, where the where you uh, fill in the edges of if you if you can show that excluding all of them gives you large mu, that means that excluding H gives you large mu. So that's where this, this weird thing about if you're a co-graph plus a leap and a co-graph and a stable set, that's where that comes from. Now let me show you show you uh, some of the proof. The Danish Heinel result said if you're age free, you've got to get a set, you've got to get two sets of size g over power of mu, which are dense or sparse. Right? It mean, sparse meaning everyone's got to be something like one over two mu. Everybody's got degree at most uh, B over something like two mu. The important thing is there's mu in the denominator. I mean, you can make you can make this a power of mu if you want it or it's any function. But first I will prove that you've got to contain two sets of size G over mu to the K where they're either, it's either close to no edges or close to all edges. So here we can do a Here's a step up from Erdős Heinel. Exclude any graph, you, you can get an AB which is sparse. You can get it sparse, you don't have to write the dense option. Not quite, but I'll tell you. What. And then by going to the complement, you can also get an AB which is dense. So you can not only, Erdős Heinel can get dense or sparse, but they don't know which. But we can get both. And that makes, that's much better. That's nice, because it, it, not often you beat Erdős Heine. I think with basically the same hypotheses, we actually get a better result. Let me show you why. So here's my graph G. And let me, I'll assume it's big. And I'll assume, put it, you know, mu is the largest co-graph. So in particular, the largest clique is not very big. I mean, it's only mu. And it's the theorem that, you know, there's Ramsey's theorem. If you don't have a big clique, then you have a big stable set. But more than that, you've got, uh, you can prove there exists a lot of stable sets. There exists, uh, G 
Um, fix any k for all for all k there exists uh, size of g to the k divided by some power of mu mu to the I don't know l stable sets of size k. But what's important here is that this is a power of g to the k. The number of stable sets of size k. I mean, the number that there could possibly be is only g to the k. And we're, we're sort of approaching that. It's g to the k with this, with this error. Um, on the other hand, so that's lots of copies of a graph with no edges. A k vertex graph with no edges. On the other hand, there's no copies of our graph H. If we're, we're assuming a, G is H free. So let's assume G is H free. And K is the number of vertices of H. So we've got lots of copies of the stable set. We've got no copies of our graph H. So how many copies have you got of, what about the copies of say that graph? filling one edge. How many copies of that have you got? Maybe there are lots, maybe there are not. Maybe there's somewhere in between. And if there are still lots, what about copies of that? And let's slowly build up H. Let's keep adding edges one at a time until we get to H. And at every stage, I'm going to count the number of copies of this graph. And the number of that will drop, but it might drop. Um, it starts out at this thing. And so for, for no edges, we're getting g to the k over u to the l. Uh, for eh edges, we're getting zero, zero copies. So what happens to the sequence as we go along? Um, take any number, take any number q you like, less than one. Then let me let me ask if there's one edge. Maybe I get at least q times g to the k over mu to the l. If there's two edges, maybe I get q squared over g to the k mu to the l. And not all these statements can be true, because by the time I get here, it's going to be zero. So this geometric sequence, I've got to I've got to break away from it sometime. There's got to be two consecutive two consecutive graphs where I do have lots of copies of one and I don't have lots of copies of the next one. And that's a, that's a good place to look. So what does that mean? And let's say I've got Q to the R, Q to the I minus one, uh, this constant g to the k over mu to the l is just being carried along. g to the k over mu to the l. Copies of you know, hi, hi minus one. And, and fewer than q to the i, g to the k over mu to the l. Copies of hi. Where hi is the graph H with I is filled in and H I minus one is the graph H with, I mean, I'm starting with the graph with no ages and filling in I ages in order to, on the way to making H. So if say H was C5, then H0 would be no ages, H1 would be one edge, Oops. H2 is two edges, Chosen arbitrarily doesn't matter, and so on until I get to the H five. So, so suppose I do have lots of copies of that, and I don't have lots of copies of the next one. I'm, I'm allowing the number to drop by this factor of q, but it has to drop more than that because it's got to hit zero at some stage. So, 
Well, I can tell you lots of copies of, of this. So how do these, how does HI minus one and HI differ? The, it's got HI minus one, it's got, here's HI minus one. And HI has got an extra edge. It's the same graph plus one extra edge. And uh, what does it mean that I have lots of copies of HI minus one? Let me count all the copies of HI minus one in G. So here's G. Let's look at a particular one. It says living here. There's a copy of HI minus one. Um, let's call this bit here the base. Um, how many different bases are there? There's only, I mean, the base has got K minus two vertices. So there's only G for the K minus two possible bases. And yet I've got this many copies of HI minus one, which has got a G to the K on the top. So some base extends into something like this constant times G squared ways. So there's going to be a quadratic number of ways to extend it. Quadratic times this constant, Q to the I minus one over mu to the L. Which means the number of ways you can extend on, sort of on average is, and the number of non edges here, because the number of copies of HI minus one is, if I call this A and B, so the number of non edges between A and B is something like. Q to the I minus one G squared over B to the L. On average, on average, over average overall basis. So let's just consider the basis where this is, you know, at least the at least say half the average. If I, if I ignore the bases which don't give me many, don't extend to many copies of HI minus one, it doesn't make much difference. If I just keep the bases that extend to at least half the average number. I don't lose many copies of HI minus So the, the, the good thing about that is when I look at any one of these bases, both the sets A and B have to be big. Because there's got to be that many non edges between them. So they each have to have size Q to the I minus one G over mu to the L at least. So look at any one of these, A and B are both big. Um, and if they all have a ton of edges here, that's a lot of copies of HI. And it, HI is the same as HI minus one, except that age is missing. Uh, sorry, that age is present. HI, HI is the same as HI minus one, except I need to add that age. So if all these bases that extend in a lot of ways have a lot of ages between A and B, then I get a lot of copies of HI, right? and I don't get a lot of copies of HI. So there's got to be some base that extends to, to a lot of ways HI minus one and doesn't extend in a lot of ways to any time. So the two sets A and B are big, and this is sparse. And that's what I promised I'd prove. But uh, you get two sets of size, of size this, we'll take Q to be one over mu or something. Take Q to be one over two mu. And this is these two sets. <laughs> the number of non is that big. Each of the sets is only two. The product of A and B is at least that big. A and B is at least most G. So each of A and B is at least Q to the I minus one G over mu to the L. Because the other one can't be all up, so it can't be more than G. Um, so both these sets are at least that big. And we'll take Q to be one over mu, something like that. And, and so that's what I wanted to prove that you get the ehrlich theorem both sparse and dense. Assuming you don't have a big click and a big signal. Now, why is that good? So let's take our graph now. 
So we're trying to prove, you know, now we have a, let, let's do a, let's say H is a co-graph plus a vertex. So this is H. And now my graph G is H3. And I want to know, I mean, I'm trying to prove H is friendly. So I can get two sets like this that are sparse with dense, and they're, and they're big. These are sets of size G over some power of mu. Uh, actually, I can get them sparse. Let's, let's say uh, I want to get them sparse. And now, I, I'm trying to build this co-graph. So let's, let's forget the extra vertex for a moment. Let's just think about the co-graph. The co-graph, maybe it's disconnected. And that's why I'm going, to get, I'm going for these sparse. And now, maybe what's in here is, is it's a complete join. And let's say this is also a complete join. Uh, so now I'm going to apply induction. This co-graph is smaller, and I can induct it to get it in here. This is still H3. It's a smaller graph, but I can do the same argument inside it. And I can get two sets of size. This over mu to the k, which is, so this is g over mu to the 2k, where these are very dense. And repeat. And I can build any sort of co-graph pattern I like. In particular, I can, I can build this co-graph pattern, the co-graph I'm, I'm aiming for. So I can sort of get a blow up of any co-graph I want, in particular my target co-graph. I can get a blow up of it. What does that mean? I can get, if, if say here's my, let's have a co-graph. Say, say this is, is that a co-graph? Uh, all right, say that. Say this is this is the co-graph C. I can get uh, sets like this, one step for each of these vertices, where when there's supposed to be an edge, this is very dense. And this is very sparse. I can get a blow up like that. The sets of sizes G over power of mu. It's not mu to the k anymore, it's, it's mu to the k square or k cubed or something. I guess it'll be k to the fourth if I have four vertices here. Um, and density is again one over mu or something like one over two mu. Why is that good? That gives us hundreds of copies of the co of the co-graph C. Uh, pick any vertex here. I, I like to pick one vertex from each that gives us the co-graph C. Oh, pick any vertex you like. It's got a few non-neighbors there, but but forget this non-neighbors. It's only got a very few. Um, I shouldn't have said density one over mu. I need density smaller than that. But you can arrange density to be whatever you want. Let's say it's got very few non-neighbors here, so almost all of this is left. Any one of these will do for the second vertex. So pick one. And now. He's got very few non-neighbors there. He's got very few non-neighbors there. Almost all of these are left, and pick one. And now over here, he's got very few non-neighbors. He's got very few neighbors. He's got very few neighbors. So almost everybody is good. And again, pick one of these. So you can get a ton of copies of the co-graph H. That's not a surprise. We already know the Erdős Heinel conjecture for co-graphs. We know if you exclude a co-graph, no, sorry. Yeah, if you exclude a co-graph, you, you must get a big clique or stable set. So if you don't have a big clique or stable set, you must contain the co-graph. And in fact, you must contain lots and lots of copies of it. But this gives us another way to see that, that you've, got, you've now got lots of copies of the co-graph. But that's not really what we wanted. We wanted co-graph plus an extra vertex. So look at this thing. Look at this thing with the extra vertex. The extra, I don't know what this extra. Here's all the rest of the world. Now these sets didn't use up all the graph yet. They, were, they used only a small, a small fraction of it. So most of the graph is up here. Could there be? Suppose I can find a vertex here that's 
you know, I'm, I'm trying to say the graph I'm really trying to get is you know, that. So it's not a cool graph. Let's, let's say it's that. This is my extra vertex. So if I can get this guy with a neighbor there and a neighbor there in such a way that these can be extended to a copy of C, that would give me my copy of H. So can I do that? Well, pick a vertex here. If it has a lot of neighbors in this set, and a lot of neighbors in that set, and a lot of non-neighbors in this set, and a lot of non-neighbors in that set, then I can do the argument I just said and pick vertices from all these four things to get a copy of C, and that would be, be correctly adjacent to my vertex. So we can assume every vertex out here, it's either got only a few neighbors where you want it to have neighbors, or it's only got a few non-neighbors where you want it to have non-neighbors. So suppose it's got so a quarter of them, let's say, they've only got a few neighbors, they've only got a few neighbors here. So this is something like G over four. It's nearly all the vertices, and it's a quarter of them. And they're all of them sparse into this. They don't have so many neighbors, they don't have enough. They have one over a one over a quite a large power of mu. They're only joined to a fraction of one over a large power of mu of that set. And this set is size g over a power of b. So what have I got? I've got a linear set and a set of size g over a power of mu, where people here have only got a few neighbors there. And that's what I said was the winning configuration for proving, addition, proving our result by induction. Now we're trying to get two sets where uh, one is linear, one is g over a power of mu, and there's sparse of dense. And we've got them. That's, so that's that's the proof. That's uh, that proves uh, co-graph plus a vertex. So co-graph plus uh, you no, know, I had this graph with six vertices out here, uh, but I couldn't say what the edges between them were. If I really want to get six vertices here, yeah, just do it again. You know, you can assume there is a vertex here with correct adjacency. Lots of neighbors where you wanted to have neighbors, and lots of non-neighbors where you wanted to have non-neighbors. Now look at the rest of them. If he's got lots of neighbors among his neighbors, you know, assuming I want them to have a common neighbor here, if he's got lots of neighbors among these neighbors, and he's got, good. Okay. I've now decided I like this vertex. He's got a good number of neighbors where I want them and a good number of non-neighbors where I want them. So forget the rest of these sets, just focus then on those subsets. And just do the same argument again. These sets have shrunk, but they're still g over a power of mu, they're just a bigger power of mu. So I can pick a second vertex with the right adjacency, and another vertex with the right adjacency, another vertex. And I won't know what the ages between them are. But if I don't care what the ages between them are, if however the ages between them turn up, I'm happy, then I can guarantee to get that. And that's where this, you know, this, uh, that's, uh, that's the proof. So I don't know where it's going. I'm not sure, if, you know, I, we're, we've been a bit stuck for the last, two or three days, so I don't know. I'm not sure if it's coming to the end or if it's going to go further, but uh, but it's been quite fun at the moment. I mean, we work so hard on Irish Heinel and we keep grinding around among these two or three little graphs that we can prove it for. It makes a change to to prove a slightly different conjecture and to be able to prove it for many more graphs. It's just, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> cheers us up. Anyway, let me stop there, thanks. Thank you very much.